My name is David Cobb. I like to say I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days I am a pissed off American citizen. Yeah? yeah. 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 All right, look. I'll make no bones about it. I consider myself a progressive, and I wear that political uh, label and title with pride, and I think that as a progressive, uh, that we make a mistake if we somehow allow the conservative movement or the Tea Party to claim some sort of monopoly on outrage in this country. Yeah. You know, because mostly how they articulate that outrage is the fact that the Wall Street and the big banksters destroyed the economy and then the government rewarded them with $700 billion of our tax dollars. Well, you know what? I'm angry about that too. How about you? Yeah. yeah. yeah? We can't allow the right wing to be the only voice that's articulating what I will call a righteous indignation. And I do want to be clear about something, folks, that, that there is a level at which anger is appropriate. Right? I mean, now, if you get angry about something and you spend your whole life in anger, you've got a problem. But if you don't get angry about the fact that 20% of the children of this country go to bed hungry at night, then I suggest maybe you've got a different kind of problem. If you're not angry about the fact that we are engaged in practices that are clearly driving our country and this world over an edge, then you've got a problem. And I want to point out something, that every great social movement in this country was actually fueled at the initial stages by a kind of righteous anger. The abolitionists were angry at the pathology of owning other human beings. That is sick, and they were angry about it, and they were righteously angry about it. Women who gathered together at Seneca Falls were angry about the fact that they were not treated like human beings and didn't have rights under the law. People were angry about the fact that children were put to work in coal mines. People were angry about the fact that they got shot at when they tried to organize for better working conditions and they were angry about the fact that it was a criminal conspiracy. It was against the law to organize uh, your fellow workers to demand better working conditions or better rights. They were pissed and they should have been. And you know, for me, one of the things that's most heartbreaking, quite honestly, is that I can remember what it was like when I could say I was a proud and patriotic American with no other qualifier. <laughs> and for me, quite honestly, that's when I was a little boy. When I was taught that I was from the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, that my country stood for liberty, justice, and equality. And not only that, but my country was like some great shining light on the hill that would guarantee liberty, justice, and equality for the entire world. Man, I was so proud to be from that country. Now, as a little boy, I'm not going to pretend for a second that I understood all of the philosophical implications of that, but I did know this, that it meant somehow that I was from a country and from a people who were fair, who were just, who were decent. And when I grew up, I realized I had been lied to. <laughs> Now, I want to be clear, it's not the kind of lie that you might be thinking about because I can remember Mrs. Armstrong, my fifth grade teacher. Any fifth grade teacher or any t public school teachers at all here in the crowd? I don't think that we, uh, as, a, as a society and as a community, thank our public school teachers enough. And, and I, I always like to remember Mrs. Armstrong because she was a good one. She did not go to bed at night saying, Wah, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> I can't wait till those children come into school so I can fill their mind full of lies and propaganda about this country. No! Mrs. Armstrong was a public school teacher because she wanted to teach children. She wanted to help children to become productive members of society. She wanted to help children learn how to think. Uh, and, you know, she was a damn good woman and she was a fine school teacher. And I submit to you that the reason she was effective is because she believed the creation myth that she was telling us. <laughs> and that it worked on me as a child, and many of you I'm seeing you nod your heads in the crowd, it worked on you because you wanted to believe it. You see, I'll submit to you that it is our birthright 
that we want to live in a society that's based on individual liberty and freedom, and that we want to live in justice, and we want to live sustainably with the natural world. That's what we want, and that's what we deserve. And may I suggest to you that we want those things not because we're Americans, but because we're human beings. And further, I'll suggest that Iraqi children want that too. Children in the Congo want that. Icelandic children want that. You see, those are human values. And if we can actually get our heads around the idea that we really are sisters and brothers in this, that we share some core human values, and that what we not only want, but what we deserve is human freedom, and we deserve justice, and we deserve sustainability, and we deserve the power to create our own lives, then I think we'll be on to something. Then we can take our righteous anger about how problematic our current social, political, and economic institutions are, and we can turn it into action. How's that sound? <laughs> All right. You'll notice that I put up four big concepts here that I want to turn to really quickly and let you all know. I don't have like Scott does the, the fancy PowerPoint, but I got the old-fashioned dry erase board. Here's the concepts that we're going to cover uh, in, our, in my presentation, and then I hope we'll have some community dialogue on it. The first concept is democracy. Somebody shout out a, a quick definition of democracy, the word. Government of the people, by the people, and for the well, people. Well, that is, that is, a, that is a, a very good one. It's what we're taught here. Does anybody know what language that's from? Greek. 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 Demos means? People. The people. Kratia means? Rule, actually, or power. Oh, rats. So the people rule, or the people have the power. Does anybody believe that the people of the United States are actually ruling today? Go ahead, raise your hands. Don't be shy. Right? You know what, folks? I do this lecture, I do this presentation, I do this workshop all over the country, sometimes to hundreds of people. It is rare that anybody actually will articulate that we the people are actually ruling our own government. Five years ago, people would proudly assert, yeah, we've got some problems, but this is still a democracy. The people really rule in this country. Certainly 10 years ago that was the case. I'm telling you that we are seeing a shift. People are beginning to realize that we the people, for all the fine rhetoric of this country, are no longer ruling ourselves. And I'll tell you something, folks, that is a problem. And that takes us to the next concept, and that is the concept of sovereignty. Does anybody know what sovereignty means? The idea of sovereignty, the concept, is who has the authority to rule? Who has the justification to rule? For example, you know, just uh, not so long ago, uh, who was the sovereign 500 years ago across Europe? King. The king. And where did the king get his authority to rule? Right. God. God, you don't get more legitimate. Right? I mean, if you can assert that your right to rule comes directly from God and you have the rest of society on board with you, that's something. Let's do a little exercise. This is always fun for me. You'll see what I mean. I'm going to ask you all to, to it help if you close your eyes, but you don't have to, but I'm going to ask you all to repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. <laughs> and as the king, he is God's representative on earth. And as the king, he is God's representative on earth. And therefore, everything he says must be obeyed. So a couple of quick observations. Not a single one of you could get that out without scoffing or, or guffawing. <laughs> this woman, Tyler, this fellow right here wouldn't even do it. Many of you, many of the rest of you ever feel it, am I right? You wouldn't even do it, would you? Good for you. You know why y'all laughed? You know why they wouldn't do it? Because it's stupid. <laughs> right? I mean, that is utterly balderdash. That is outrageous to think that any one human being can claim the right to rule and tell you how to live your life, or even better, how society ought to be organized because of who my mama and daddy are, that's crazy. And 500 years ago, people just like you believed it. The reason that I make such a big deal about pointing that out is to have us come to terms with the fact that ideas are powerful, that 
if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like something is true, you know what happens? It becomes true, in fact. We are all collectively engaged in creating social constructs every day. And I say that to underscore the fact that if enough of us begin to think differently and act differently about the society that we live in and assert the society that we want to live in, you know what we can do? We can create a new reality. I think that's a very important idea that, frankly, in this country, we have somehow forgotten in the midst of being entertained with sporting events and American Idol and uh, Dancing with the Stars and such nonsense. There's a place for all that, to be sure. But I think that too often uh, we are being hypnotized. Uh, we are being distracted. The next concept that I'll describe is legal personhood. Uh, you notice I didn't put corporate personhood, and that's because the concept of legal personhood means that you have the right, or you, have, you can assert rights, let's put it that way. You can assert rights under law. If you are legally a person, that means that you have the ability to assert rights under law. And then lastly, the corporation. Now, does anybody know what language that's from? Latin. Latin, that's right. Can you break that down? Body. body. The body and the T-I-O-N, the suffix. This is really interesting. It means the state of having or uh, the state of being. So the reason that's important is because the corporation means to give body. Because, by the way, besides me and Pat, any other lawyers in the room? This is a friendly crowd. You can admit it here, I think. <laughs> okay, we're taught in first year... Uh, law school that a corporation is a legal fiction. Remember that, Pat? Sure. You know what it means? A corporation doesn't really exist in the real world. It doesn't actually exist. But we'll pretend like it exists, we'll act like it exists, so that we can treat it a certain way, this new entity coming together, so a social construct that if enough people think it exists, if enough people act like it exists, it exists. It exists. I mean, it comes into being. And I'm going to declare this a truth-telling zone, okay? You know, I'm going to tell you all the truth as I see it. It may not be the truth as you see it, but at least I'm going to tell you honestly and clearly how I see things and will invite you to do the same so that we can hopefully figure out what's going on here. And so the first truth that I'll tell you about these four concepts, the United States of America is not now, nor has it ever been. In fact, it was not designed to actually be a functioning democracy. That's a hard one for a lot of folks, it, and I'll be honest with y'all, it was a hard one for me to come to terms with. Because, see, I bought that creation myth uh, in elementary school. I'll admit it, maybe it's because I'm a, uh, I was a white man. I grew up in poverty, but the power of white supremacy and white skin privilege in this country is profound. Right? And it, it, and it helps to hypnotize a lot of things. And men, male supremacy, and gender privilege is profound in this country. And it really shapes us, uh, I'll say. Again, I'm just telling my truth as I see it. The United States is not a democracy. And I'll tell you something further. Part of the problem is because these large transnational corporations, and I don't mean the mom and pop, I'm talking about the huge mega corporations of today. Corporations are no longer merely exercising power. They are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled their slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling us because they are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect our lives. They are making the decisions about how much toxins will be spewed into the air that we all have to collectively breathe or the water that we all have to drink from. They're making the decisions about what our transportation choices will be. They're making the decisions about what our health care options will be or evermore what they won't be. They're making the decisions about whether this country goes to war or not. And here's a quick pop quiz. How many people here are eating genetically modified organisms on a daily basis? Right? All the hands went up. Why? Because we don't know. Because we're all, we don't know, but we can all rest assured that we're all eating some GMOs on a daily basis. Why? And, and here's the question. I'll submit this to you. We're eating that because it's in our public food supply. It is a public food supply. But who made the decision to put the... And I'm not going to talk about whether GMAs are a good or a bad idea, right? We'll put that aside for a moment. I don't, you know, 
but I'll just say the process for the decision, right? Who got, who had the authority to make that decision? Who made the decision? Corporation. Agriculture Corporation, specifically Monsanto Corporation, Pioneer Hybrid Corporation, Archer Daniels Midland Corporation, and check it out. They made what I will submit to you is clearly a public policy decision, and they made it behind closed doors, claiming this is just a private corporate decision, so we were not even aware that that decision was being made, much less were we allowed to participate in any meaningful way. And after the fact did we find out, and now the big argument in the United States is about labeling it or not. You know what the argument is uh, across Europe? Banning it. They're actually saying, no, we don't want to hear it all. If that's true, if I'm right about that, that these corporations have basically uh, taken over so much of the governing uh, of this country, it, it behooves us to ask, well, where did the corporation as an entity come from? What's the, what's the social construct or the, the legal creation of the corporation? Well, the word corporation is Latin because the first corporations ever created by the genius of man was during the Roman Republic, not the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we had enough time to really delve into what happens when a nation state devolves from being a republic to an empire. Because that might be an important conversation today. <laughs> Maybe that will come up during the discussion afterwards. But the genius of the corporation was created during the Roman Republic. With the, and I am not anti-corporation, and I hope we'll get a chance to really delve into that. I am not anti-corporation. And the genius of the corporation uh, was used to create... The road system. Y'all have heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Yep. All right, that entire system of roads were <coughs> built by and maintained by a corporation. The aqueduct system, you know that amazing bit of civil engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula? With no electricity, human beings are clever, right? I mean, we can do a lot if you harness the creativity and entrepreneurial spirit. That aqueduct system was designed by built by, maintained by a corporation. Likewise, the first universities, we're here at a university, the first entities that we would think of and understand and would look like universities in any way, shape, or form today, the corporation. The first hospitals, corporations. Anybody see anything in common with a road system, a water system, hospitals, universities? Infrastructure. Common good. Well, common good. Common good. It's infrastructure, specifically public infrastructure, right? So the genius of the corporation in its creation was the idea of taking voluntary private money or resources and putting it specifically to public good. Now notice I said voluntary because let's say, I think I've got this great idea for, for, for building this water system. Could I get a donation of money for you just a little bit to pitch in? I'm going to try to get other people. Would you be willing to volunteer? Absolutely. Fantastic. How about you, Richard? Sure, Could you man. do it? Ma'am, would you? Yeah. yeah. Sir, would you? Say no. Would you, sir? I'd be a little reluctant. Reluctant? Oh, can I, can I talk you into it? How about, if I, how about if I told you if you would, if you'd pony up a little money, maybe I could return uh, your investment. Maybe I, uh, I'm not asking. These folks gave me a donation. It's harder to get it from you, so maybe I can entice you with, with it. can we engage in that conversation? Awesome. Here's a question. When the Roman centurions show up to collect taxes, do we engage in the kind of negotiation I engage with this fella? No, the spear's to his throat, right? The point I'm making is this. The idea of taking private money to public use wasn't new. I mean, that had been done as taxes. But the genius of the corporation was to take voluntary money, capital, sweat equity, call it what you will, and to try to put it to public use. And I actually think that is a brilliant thing. It really is a brilliant way to try to think about how might we collectively organize and capitalize both money or raw goods and services uh, and materials and to put it to different uses. But here's the thing, y'all. The modern transnational corporation doesn't exactly operate that way, does it? Sadly, no. And that's because the modern transnational corporation doesn't actually have its roots in the era of the Roman Republic. Instead, it comes out of the 13th and 14th century of Europe. 
something that we have been taught to think of as the age of discovery. I have to put discovery in quotation marks there, right? Because I said this was a truth-telling zone, so let's just tell the truth. This is not the age of discovery at all. I mean, what did they discover after all? Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash! There were people living there. They weren't lost. They didn't need to be discovered. So instead, in the spirit of truth-telling, let's tell the truth. What really was it? It was the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. That's what imperialism actually means. It means going out, brutally conquering another uh, people, and then stealing their resources. And guess what? The modern transnational corporation was created during that time period in order to facilitate that extraction. The East India Corporation was created very specifically to conquer military, militarily the, uh, the entire era we now know as Indonesia and to suck out those resources. Another of the early corporations is the Africa Trading Company. Does anybody want to hazard a guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? Slaves. Slaves. That's a, people say slaves, but there's another way to think about it, y'all. People. Human beings. Right? I mean, I think that, that thinking of it that way, talking about it that way, I think is a much more powerful way. Because to say slave, number one, it abstracts it. And number two, it ain't like the people that were living there in Africa were slaves. Right? They were Africans. Or they were uh, other uh, ethnicities, right? They were captured. They were subjugated. And another thing I want to say is, folks, people that were basically just like me. Now, I say that with some trepidation because I am aware of my own pigment. <laughs> but in the spirit of truth-telling, ask any scientist and they'll tell you race does not really exist. I mean, skin color exists. Pigment exists. Hair color exists for those of you who have hair. You know? I mean, that exists. Ethnicity even exists. But no scientist Certainly no biologist would, would say that you could elevate those things to a taxonomy. That doesn't make sense. But here's the thing. Race gets created during this same basic time period. And I will suggest that the reason that it gets created, if not the direct reason, inextricably linked to it, is the idea of justifying the African slave trade. Slavery had existed before then, right? Uh, now, if Richard and I are in different tribes and we go to war with one another and because I'm telling the story, my side wins. And so I put my spear up against Richard's throat. What is the philosophical or legal justification for my enslavement of Richard? You won. I won. I got the spear. Might makes right. It is nothing but brutal power over domination, right? Check it out. I suggest that the creation of race as a construct, because that's really what it is, is in order to justify the idea of enslaving an entire group of people for nothing other than pigment. And to somehow build out a philosophical, legal, even moral argument. Now, it's a perverse argument, but you see my point? That the idea of the creation of the corporation is inextricably linked to racism itself and imperialism. And it's something, by the way, that the great Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. observed, not in exactly this way, but you know, he's most famous for the I Have a Dream speech. And it's a beautiful speech, I Have a Dream. You know, uh, but the speech that I think is far more powerful was the church, was the speech he gave at the Riverside Church. Does anybody know that speech? It's, that's the speech he ought to be famous for because in it, he articulated the triple evils of militarism, racism, and rampant materialism. And he said that those triple evils were leading this country, and in fact, humanity, uh, down a path, uh, a path that he said uh, was immoral and drove him to righteous anger. So the historical context of the rise of the modern transnational corporation is very instructive. And in fact, if you fast forward to the founding of this country, you know, the 1700s, uh, how many original colonies here, by the way? This is a, a gimme. 
13. 13. And they were colonies. Colonialism, imperialism, flag that. But here's something. Does anybody know what, how many of those 13 colonies were actually corporations? All of them. Say it again. All of them. All of them, in this sense, for sure, that the creation of them to give body to, did the king magically make the land appear? No. I mean, it already existed. But check it out. Did Massachusetts exist before the king wrote a royal crown charter for it? No. Right? See the point I'm making here? The king, through granting a royal crown charter, actually creates a, the subdivision. I mean, the land had existed, the trees were there, the streams and forests were there, the people were already there, but he simply claimed that, the, that he would create Massachusetts. And by the way, do you think he created the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in that charter? No. You know what it was actually called? It was the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony. Oh. <laughs> Likewise, Virginia did not begin as the state of Virginia. It literally began as the Virginia Company. And when the king, the sovereign of the day, who claimed the authority to rule, and where did he get his power again? When he created this new thing by simply issuing a charter, right? In the charter of the original colonies, they almost all led, I create, according to these boundaries, the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony, and, I, and now it's going to be good to, to be sitting where you are, Richard, and because I, as the king, because I'm still telling the story, and as Mel Brooks tells us, it's, it's good to be the king. <laughs> so I am the supreme ruler. I have created Massachusetts, but I will now give Richard the authority to rule in my name. And in the original charters, they almost all said, to, I create a royal governor to plant, rule, and govern in my name. This, this company. Do you see that the royal governor of the original colonies then are not just governors, but they are the functional equivalent of a CEO, right? You see that? They're like a corporate chief executive officer that is given the authority and the power to make ruling decisions. Like, that's what it really is. And so, uh, you know, when you read the Declaration of Independence, right, uh, it's really important to remember that those people were not calling for a more socially responsible king or a more socially responsible royal governor or CEO. And so perhaps today, if we were going to take ourselves seriously, we might no, not merely call for more socially responsible transnational corporations. Maybe we could raise our aspirations a little bit higher. Maybe we could actually say what we really want out of our society and jointly uh, work to create to the society that we want to live in. But here's the interesting thing. If you actually look at the, the letters that those people who would become revolutionaries were writing and say, 1750s and 1760s, those letters went something like this. Oh, dear Father King, we, your humble and obedient children, come before you on bended knee because your governor and the English parliament are oppressing us mightily with unfair laws for taxation and trade policies that are unfair and the Stamp Act are making it difficult for we, your good, obedient, good Englishmen all, to do our jobs, and we ask that you intervene in our behalf. It was literally the most sniveling, groveling language that you can imagine. It was absolutely ridiculous. And somehow, those people in one generation somehow found the wherewithal, the physical, the mental, the philosophical, dare I say, the spiritual courage to get up off their knees and to stand up and to put their shoulders back and put their chin up and look at the king. And again, where did the king get his power? From God. And see behind the king the most powerful military the world had ever seen and said, you're done. Man, that's something, right? I mean, that is a very powerful idea. And so... And by the way, when our children in elementary school play out the Boston Tea Party, do y'all still do that? Those of you with elementary school children, do they still do that, the Boston Tea Party and 
play it out at pageants and such. I was Indian number three at Baycliffe Elementary. I mean, I say, it's probably my best childhood memory. I just want to point out, you know what we're, we're, we're lauding when we tell the Boston Tea Party story, don't you? Nonviolent civil disobedience to the functional equivalent of what would be literally tens of millions of dollars today. Now, I'm not saying that we should necessarily be willing to engage in that level of nonviolent civil disobedience, but I am saying that direct action gets the goods. Plant and seeds. Just plant and seeds. Do, do what you will. I'm just pointing out that people who actually take themselves seriously, take themselves seriously. And so, when the king gets thrown out, a new government gets put in its place. And so, uh, when the new government gets put in its place, we're now going to actually create a new charter. It's no longer just the king, but instead we're going to create a new entity, a new governing document. And that governing document is the supreme law of the land. And what do we call it? Constitution. The Constitution of the United States of America. How many people here have read the Constitution in the last year, let's say? Raise your hands. All right, right on. So any history, uh, political science professors here? Good job. The U.S. Constitution, uh, there are, one way to look at the Constitution is the, there are two main actors within this uh, framework. The first actor is the most important. In fact, it's the first three words of that document. We the people. We the people. I do this all over the country and everywhere I go, all I have to do is put my hand to my ears and people will shout, we the people. And you know why? because those are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. The idea of we the people actually claiming sovereignty ourselves and authority is profound. And we the people come together to create the other entity. And that, it, that's described, and that is government itself. That's because in this document, we the people are described as being free and sovereign. And again, what does sovereign mean? We rule. We govern. Government actually is not supposed to rule over us. In fact, according to this principle, government is actually subordinate. Subordinate to whom? The people. The people. Accountable to whom? The people. That's kind of got a ring to it, right? We the people are free and sovereign. In fact, we the people are described as having individual rights. Government does not have rights against the people at all. In fact, Government has duties. They don't have rights. And one way to even think about the law itself is an interchange between rights and duties. If you have the right to do something, it means you can do it and you don't need anybody's permission. You don't need government's permission. You don't need the city's permission. You can just do it. Likewise, if you have a duty, it means you must do something. You have an ob obligation to do it. And if you try to refuse to do it, then you can be compelled to do it. The interchange between rights and duties is profound. I look at this and I think, wow, that's pretty awesome, actually. This, this concept, the, the U.S. constitutional framework, where we the people are free and sovereign with rights that cannot be violated, and that we create government as subordinate and accountable. In fact, a way to think about this is that in this framework, all power resides with the people. However, we do delegate a certain amount of power to government. How much power do we delegate to government? What? Only enough to do the duties that we have decided collectively that we want the, the, the government to do on our behalf. I look at that and I think, man, I love it because this is brilliant. It really does satisfy the idea of the fact that, think of it this way, in my private realm, I have core rights that cannot be violated. So it satisfies my civil libertarian impulses. But here's the thing. It doesn't end there. Too many times our sisters and brothers in the libertarian movement only focus on your individual rights and act as if property rights are the only rights that you have at all. But this document does not end there at all. It says, yes, of course you have individual rights that are sacrosanct, but there's also a public component to it. There is an idea... It satisfies my libertarian impulses and my communitarian impulses. I look at this document framed this way. I look at that and I think, this is brilliant. It is absolutely 
utterly amazing. We should try that in this country. I think this would work. And I'm not even joking, although it is a good part, laugh line, right? But the reality is that we have never actually had a functioning democratic republic where the principles that we were taught as part of our creation myth actually functioned correctly. And why? Because before I go one second further waxing poetic about how brilliant the U.S. Constitution is, somebody tell me what year this Constitution was either drafted in convention or ratified by the state. 1787 was the convention and 89 is the ratification. And then the, the Bill of Rights are ratified in 91. Excellent. Good work. So, the reason that I really wanted to, but while I was talking about how awesome this Constitution is, and then I doubled back and said, well, wait a minute, what year does this actually go into effect to become the new government for the United States of America? Let's just stop for a moment and say, remind me again what it took to be a legal person in 1791. What were the characteristics? Man. So you had to be a man. Property owner. You had to own property. You had to be white. Except in Maryland where you had to be Catholic. So the point is, in the founding of this country, the creation myth, from the original founding of this country, you had to be a white male property owner in the right religion. So let's take out religion, and let's even take out the children, say over 21. Does anybody want to hazard a guess what percentage of the adults living in the 13 colonies were actually legally persons who could claim this incredible legacy? What percentage? 20%? 10. Maybe 6 this gentleman is the only one who is sufficiently cynical. <laughs> because the answer, quite honestly, is 5 to 7 percent oh of the adult populations actually could wrap themselves within this framework. Another way to say it, of course, is that 93 to 95 percent of the adults living here were not actually legally persons at all. Another way to say it is that this is a founding violence. It's a founding violence against the indigenous people who were already here who were subject to intentional, deliberate genocide. And if we're not willing to come to terms with that and at least talk about it, we're never going to be able to address the legacy that that has created. It's also obviously a founding violence against the Africans who were brought here at the barrel of a gun or the point of a spear and forced to build this country as slave labor. This country was built on slave labor. The White House that an African American currently occupies was built by slaves. And frankly, we've got to be willing to talk about that, and white people have got to talk about that. All right? It's my truth. I mean, I think it's very important that we have to have white people willing to talk like that. It's also a founding violence against women. Because it's not just that women couldn't vote at this time period. They couldn't own property. They couldn't own property at all. Ma'am, Women were property. By any reasonable understanding of that definition, their entire legal reality was only a function of who their father was or who their husband was. And if they didn't have a father or husband, their sons could actually act in their name. In fact, women were not allowed to engage in contracts. Here's something interesting, Pat. There's some early case law where women tried to write contracts, tried to sign their name on, and the courts voided it as a matter of law. It was not voidable, it was void on the notion of capacity. What does that mean? Well, just like children do not have the capacity to bind themselves, women literally were not allowed to have capacity to enter into contracts and make any obligation at all. And it's also a founding violence against most of the white men who were living here. Because most of the white men, as Scott actually talked about, came as indigenous servitude. What do you think that script was all about exactly? Right? I mean, the reality is from the founding of this country, there was a very small ruling elite that actually created a framework that was beautiful in its ideas, but in its impl implementation, in its actual effect, sucked. I told y'all I was going to tell the truth. I mean, it was absolutely miserable. Now, some people might say, all right, Cobb, you got a scathing critique about the original corporations of the 13th century, and you know, you, you're all bent out of shape about the original founding of this country. But relax. Women have the right to vote now. We got rid of slavery. It's all good. 
To which I would say, au contraire, mon frère. Because <laughs> now it's time to reintroduce the idea of the corporation. Does anybody know what it takes to form a corporation in Ohio today? $250. Say it loud, man. $250. $250 and an application to the Secretary of State. And as long as you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's, do you know what the Secretary of State will do? Stamp it. Rubber stamp it and issue you a corporate charter. And to show you just how easy it really is, my colleagues decided that they would uh, request articles of incorporation uh, for, uh, for themselves, and they submitted to the Secretary of State of Virginia a request, and in it they said, we intend to uh, grow uh, a plant material that we will then manufacture into an item that when used according to its uh, expected use, we know will kill people. Therefore, we're asking uh, for you to create Kill the People Incorporated. <laughs> and do you know what the Virginia, the, the state of Virginia did through the Secretary of State? They cashed the check, rubber stamped it, and created Kill the People Incorporated. Oh what, they, what, what were they doing, by the way? Tobacco. The point is that today it is super easy to create a corporation. By the way, how long does a corporation get to last today? Forever. Forever. In perpetuity, as lawyers are taught to say, provided that you continue to, to pay your annual fee. And what are you allowed to do with the corporation today? There's a term of art. Anything that is permissible under the law. Some of us who are paying attention say, well, apparently you can also do a whole bunch of illegal things uh, and get away with it. Yeah. Right, the point I'm making is just how incredibly easy it is to actually uh, create this thing called the corporation today. The reason I want to now come back to 1789, the founding of this country, do you know what it took at that time to create a corporation? Remember that corporations had existed before, so the founders understood very clearly what a, a corporation was. Uh, it used to take the king, but we kicked the king out. The king is no longer sovereign. We the people are. So instead now, you still have to go to state government, but check it out. Let me do this real quick. You had to get a bill introduced in the lower house, and it had to pass by a majority. Then that same bill had to go to the upper house, and it had to pass by a majority. And then the governor had to sign it. Does that sound like anything? It's a law. It's a law. That's how tightly controlled it was because they said you don't have the right to incorporate and get limited liability. It is a privilege to get li limited liability. And check it out. The application process had to identify a public need that was not being met either by existing business practices, you know, uh, 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 that, that did not have the privilege, not the right, but the privilege of limited liability. You had to say there is a public need that's not being met and by either government or by existing businesses. And if you were granted that privilege, do you know how long the original corporate charters lasted? Yes, sir. I don't remember, but I think I maybe 50 whales. It was not, that's, that's too long. Now you're not cynical enough. You know, earlier, Three, five, seven years, sometimes up to 10 years. Uh, the most any corporate charter ever lasted was 20 years. And then, do you know what happened to that corporate charter under the terms that it was issued? It literally dissolved. It literally dissolved. And if you wanted to recreate that corporation, you had to, uh, and then somebody else had to come through that whole process again. And by the way, even during that short time period when the corporate charter was in existence, if you were ever found to be acting outside the public interest by, I don't know, having coal miners killed or by polluting rivers or streams or doing anything that was found to be outside the public interest, do you know what happened to the corporate charter? It was revoked. The corporate death penalty was instigated immediately. And that, was, that happened with great frequency and regularity. Now, I'm not suggesting that this was the land of milk and honey for workers or women. I mean, slavery existed. Male supremacy was at its peak. What I'm saying is the corporation as an instrument was tightly controlled at this point. If I'm right that this framework is, is important, the difference between being free and sovereign and subordinate and accountable, if I'm correct that there's a difference between rights and duties, and I am, then it's worth asking, well, where should a corporation as an entity sort of go within this way of looking at it? Well, 
If a corporation is created by the, the, only the state can actually issue the charter, if the charter can describe what the duties are of a corporation are, and it can be held accountable, and I would argue it should only be allowed to act in the public interest, can you see why I would argue that a corporation should be understood to be a public entity because the privilege of limited liability is profound and that we should, the people should be able to control what these entities can or cannot do. And so, when the unelected and unaccountable U.S. Supreme Court says, oh no, actually, we on our own are simply going to say, not the government, not our elected representatives, not we the people, but the court, actually five members of the U.S. Court, Supreme Court says, really, we need to think about corporations as a person and that corporations therefore have actual rights under law, it perverts this whole framework. Corporate personhood is not just an idea that is odd or illogical, which it is. It's not just something that should concern lawyers, which it does. Even deeper still, I'm suggesting to you that this notion of corporations having constitutional rights is a linchpin for how we the people have had our authority and our right to govern ourselves stolen from us. And our legal system has been used to legitimize and legalize the theft of our sovereign, I would say our sacred right to self-government. Now I'm not going to tell you for one minute that I think that democracy or a democratic republic means that David Cobb wins or that progressives get to win. What I am telling you is what it's supposed to mean in a democratic republic is that individual human beings have rights that can never be violated by the public or by the majority, but the majority does have the right. We collectively are supposed to be making the decisions on how to organize ourselves as long as we don't violate anybody's core rights. The U.S. constitutional framework as we are told, as it's supposed to operate, is brilliant. The problem is that it was never actually that way to begin with. In fact, no less a historian than Howard Zinn has said, one way to think about the entire history of the United States of America is by a lens of ordinary groups of human beings to fight to be legally persons under the Constitution. That is a very powerful way to think about this. And the problem is that now that we've got the cultural agreement that all human beings get to be persons with rights, the wealthy elite, the small minority, and I mean the real minority, because the real minority are not women, the real minority are not even racial or ethnic minorities. The real minority is about the one half of one percent who owns damn near everything and are basically making the decisions about how our society ought, ought to be operating. The problem is that this idea has become so enshrined under law that it's become like the matrix, where we're not even aware anymore of really why everything's messed up. But when I ask, do we the people rule in this country? I'll remind you, not a single one of you were willing to say, yes, we do. Folks, I'm telling you, this idea of corporations claiming constitutional rights is a manner, it's a mechanism. Whether you're a principled conservative, whether you're a raging liberal, uh, whether you're a radical, it doesn't matter where you stand on individual issues. What I'm saying is the reality is that we can't engage in proper political discourse. We can't actually engage in the kind of meaningful debate about how to order our society if every time we pass a law, corporate lawyers can just go into court and overturn that law. Laws that are designed to try to protect the environment have been overturned because it violates the corporation's Fourth Amendment rights. Laws attempting to uh, regulate uh, corporations uh, and how they treat workers have been overturned because they violate uh, the Fifth Amendment constitutional rights. Laws that are designed to protect the safety and health of consumers and the public have been overturned. And most recently, in an egregious decision called Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, the U.S. court overturned campaign finance laws designed to protect the integrity of our electoral yeah. process. And let me just really underscore, five members of the U.S. Supreme Court took it upon themselves to overturn the McCain-Feingold campaign laws. You know, John McCain, Republican, Russ Feingold, Democrat, a bipartisan agreement 
that, that took enormous amount of political negotiation and skill that had overwhelming support by most Americans. In fact, most Americans didn't think that it was strong enough. What happened to that law? The court said it worked and treated corporations and other wealthy people like an oppressed minority. A direct quote, <laughs> an oppressed minority. And it was up to the court to protect these corporate rights because the majority was oppressing the wealthy. So I guess the point I'm making is this, folks. Throughout all of American history, it has taken ordinary people to actually say the promise of a democratic republic is worth fighting for. Because although this country did not start out as the way we are, we are taught that it did, we do know that there have been great moments in American history. Those women who gathered together at Seneca Falls were not, they were not granted the right to vote. That says it the wrong way. They demanded the right to vote and they damn sure changed culture so that it reflected that. And the abolitionists were not just saying, we think slavery is a bad idea. They committed themselves, white folks and black folks working together and said, we are going to put an end to this pathology that the entire social, political, and economic fabric of this country depends upon because it's wrong. The trade union movement that, that Scott mentioned earlier, I mean, these people were being killed. They were being lynched. They were being, like, they were being imprisoned, right? Every single movement that ever has existed in this country to make this country a more just, a more fair, a more democratic place, those movements took people just like you to actually get together and say, ya basta, enough already. It doesn't have to be this way. So I'm coming here to you today to say we can do it too. If you, like me, think that it's time to correct the court and say to the court, you are wrong. You have usurped your authority. You do not have the right to actually say that our Constitution uh, can be used to prevent us from controlling uh, corporations or any other business entity. If you agree with me, then I want to invite you to please join and check this number out. 110,000 other Americans in an effort called Move to Amend. <coughs> Move to Amend is a national coalition of ordinary folks, or mostly local organizations, uh, who have come together with a seriousness that says, we are going to actually correct this decision. And by the way, we don't think that the problem is just corporate money and elections. We think it's the corporatization of our society. We think that, 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 that allowing corporations to overturn environmental laws or safety laws or, or, or worker protection laws, that's, an illegit that's illegitimate. We should have debates and maybe we'll lose. Maybe my, my vision won't win, but it's inappropriate to allow courts to come in and fix the game before it even begins. So I'm going to ask two things. One, I'm going to ask if you'd like to join this movement to please add your name. Uh, and again, 110,000 people. Anybody want to guess how many times that I or, or our movement has been covered by, I wouldn't even call it mainstream media, corporate media? Corporate. No. How many times do you think, sir? Uh, maybe at most two. The answer is zero. 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 As we say where I'm from, not a cotton picking time. <laughs> and we do say that. <laughs> However, this movement is happening from people's media. So if you're watching this right now, it's probably because, I'm going to guess, are we on cable access? We are on cable access, people's media, and because people like you were willing to sign this petition and you were willing to, to forward this petition to other folks. And I'm going to start one on the back here. Uh, and if y'all keep this on each side.